Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the spinal cord, its anatomy, and then also the nerves that arise from the spinal cord, called the spinal nerves, as well as the tracts that run up and down between the spinal cord and the brain. Images that are not referenced are images obtained from the OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology book. The spinal cord is really just an extension of your brain. Think of it almost as the tail of your brain. And because of that, it functions as a two-way communication system for information to go from the brain down the spinal cord to the body and in the opposite direction, that is, from the body up the spinal cord into the brain. Your spinal cord is also, remember, part of the central nervous system, and because of that, it also has functions um, that deal with integration, and especially we're going to look at spinal reflexes uh, in another presentation. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the spinal cord and, and first focus on the uh, on, on the log longitudinal section of the spinal cord. So clearly your spinal cord is located inside of the vertebral column, but what's interesting is that the spinal cord doesn't run the full length of the vertebral column. So on the left picture, I am now pointing to the full length of the vertebral column, which as you know, starts at the foramen magnum basically, um, which is the start of your spinal cord. But your vertebral column ends at the coccygeal bone, while your spinal cord, on the other hand, ends at about lumbar vertebra number one. And the spinal cord has a bit of a pointy area there, and I'm now switching to uh, the image on the right-hand side, where we just see um, sort of the fibers on the inside of the spinal cord. For instance, it starts right about here, because notice that above my arrow it says decussation of the pyramid, so we know that that's still the medulla. Um, so the point and the end of the spinal cord is illustrated here. We call that the conus medullaris. The conus medullaris spelled out for you right there. So beyond this point, beyond the conus medullaris, we do not have central nervous um, system anymore. We don't have the spinal cord anymore, which is part of the central nervous system. Instead, we have a continuation of the pia mater called the phylum terminale. And we will see that better on the next picture. Now, within the spinal cord, we do see a couple of areas that are wider than most of the other areas. And we refer to these as enlargements. So at the level of the cervical region, we see a cervical enlargement. And then we also see a lumbar enlargement. And the reason for why uh, the spinal cord looks wider there is because those are areas that give rise to spinal nerves that either innervate the um, upper limbs or the lower limbs. And of course, that implies that there's a lot of information entering and leaving the spinal cord uh, for those structures. Now, <clears throat> as I said, the spinal cord gives rise to spinal nerves, and we will um, look at those in more detail when we get to the peripheral nervous system. But for now, you should be aware of the fact that we have a total of 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So nerves arise from either side of the spinal cord. Your spinal cord is bilaterally symmetrical, as we'll see better on a cross-section in just a moment. And it consequently gives rise to spinal nerves on either uh, side of it. So just to quickly comment on why the spinal cord is so much shorter than your vertebral column. Well, that has to do with the fact that the spinal cord stops growing much, much sooner than the vertebral column does. So the vertebral column continues to grow for a longer time period, both in uh, the embryo and the child, uh, compared to the, the spinal cord. Um, 
The image that we're looking at over here is that very inferior portion of the vertebral column, um, such that what we see right at this point here is that pointy structure that indicates the end of the um, spinal cord. And in English, it can be called the medullary cone. Most often, though, we refer to it with its more scientific name called the conus medullaris. So that's where your spinal cord ends. Um, but as I said, lots of spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord uh, nearby that conus medullaris, but these spinal nerves are going to first descend, and by that I mean they're going to arise from the spinal cord, perhaps over here, and then they're going to move downward and eventually leave through one of the foramina, either the uh, intervertebral foramina at the lumbar level or through the sacral foramina um, to go innervate the body. Now, because of the look of all of these um, nerves descending down the vertebral column before they leave the vertebral column, they are given the name cauda equina, which literally means tail of a horse, because that's what it looks like. Realize, can't stress this enough, one more time, your spinal cord ends at the conus medullaris. So all of these nerves that form the cauda equina, actually they're really nerve roots, as we will learn better in just a little bit, they're part of your peripheral nervous system. Anything outside of the brain or the spinal cord is considered to be part of the peripheral nervous system. By the way, these spinal nerves or nerve roots or the whole cauda equina area is still surrounded by um, cerebrospinal fluid and even um, part of the meninges, just like your brain, your spinal cord is covered by meninges. But because we don't have the actual spinal cord tissue in the cauda equina, it's actually safe to collect cerebrospinal fluid from the cauda equina area. We call that um, a lumbar tap when we uh, insert a rather big needle in this area to collect the cerebrospinal fluid. On the previous slide, I briefly mentioned the phylum terminale, which is basically how it's the structure with which this point of the spinal cord is attached to the coccygeal area. And that tissue, which is connective tissue, is really a continuation of, your, of the pia mater. We'll look at the meninges that surround the spinal cord here next. When you study the brain, you also learn about the various ways that the brain is protected. And one of those ways was the meninges. Well, we also have meninges around the spinal cord. They're basically just an extension of those that we found around the brain, and their anatomy is very similar. So first of all, what are they? We once again have a, a dura mater, we have an arachnoid mater, and we have a pia mater. Dura mater being the most superficial, with the pia mater directly touching the spinal cord. So on the left-hand picture, the outer layer is the dura mater, if we reflect it, which has been done here, this is basically the dura mater peeled back. We get then get to the arachnoid mater. And then it, touching the spinal cord tissue directly is your pia mater. And notice that there's these special structures that keep um, the, the spinal cord anchored to the vertebral column. There's one difference between the meninges of the brain and the spinal cord. You might recall that uh, the, the, meninge, the dura mater, mater of the brain, I should say, was double layered, such that it created spaces in between those two layers of the dura mater, and those spaces were filled with venous blood. We called those spaces the dural sinuses. Well, we don't have two layers in the dura mater, surrounding the spinal cord. It's just a single layer. But what we do find is that 
in between the dura mater of the spinal cord and the periosteum of the vertebral of the vertebra we're going to have a space and that is not showing here that space with where I'm pointing here but you need to imagine it and we call that space the epidural space and if you translate that word it makes sense it's the space on top of the dura mater so it's the space in between the dura mater and the, the periosteum that covers the, the, the bone of the vertebra. Well, that space is filled with lots of fatty tissue and is very vascularized, which is why epidurals are given in this particular space. The vascularization allows for the medicine to easily spread um, towards the part of the body that we're interested in, in, in medicating uh, or anesthetizing. Just like we saw in the subarachnoid space around the brain, we also have uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord. And though we don't have ventricles inside of the spinal cord, the fourth ventricle of the brain continues into a, a rather small canal in the center of the spinal cord called um, uh, that is also filled with cerebrospinal fluid inside of the spinal cord. So we have cerebrospinal fluid surrounding the spinal cord and we have cerebrospinal fluid inside of the spinal cord in that central canal. So the whole setup, the whole anatomy is very similar um, between the spinal cord's meninges and the brain's meninges with one big difference and that is that we do not have a double layered dura mater instead we have a single layered dura mater which is somewhat separated from the periosteum of the vertebrae with the help of an, an epidural space that is filled with that fat so that provides some extra protection to the spinal cord as well let's take a look now at a cross section of the spinal cord inside of a vertebra. This vertebra, as you can tell, if you have studied the vertebrae in lab, has a spinous process that is bifurcated, and it also has the transverse foramina, which here are called in its Latin foramen transversium. And therefore, these two structures, or these two bone markings, tell you that you're dealing with a cervical vertebra just as um, a reference point for you guys here. Now notice that the vertebral canal in which the spinal cord with its meninges and epidural space is located is not that big. This is really just a um, kind of a sketch. It's, the meninges are not detailed here. For instance, what we're finding, let me just point out first of all, only this right here is the spinal cord and the spinal cord has inside of it the gray matter often in the shape of a letter H and then it has surrounding that gray matter the white matter. You can clearly see that the spinal cord just like the brain is bilaterally symmetrical and we'll look more at more of the details of the anatomy of a cross section of the spinal cord in just a little bit. You can see that there are nerves arising from the spinal cord that eventually form a single nerve, which we will call the spinal nerve. And then we have the meninges surrounding the spinal cord, which, like I said just a minute ago, are not very differentiated here. Um, but in the yellow, this image is trying to illustrate to you the location of the the uh, epidural space. It's called a foramen as in the vertebral foramen in which the spinal cord with its meninges and epidural space is located. So this should start to give you a feel for how the spinal cord with the nerves that arise from it is situated. So clearly where the spinal nerve is leaving through the openings in between the vertebrae, we call those openings the intervertebral foramina. 
you might re remember this. I'm going to abbreviate. And in the case, if we're looking at the openings of the sacrum, we call those the sacral foramina. So when we focus on just the spinal cord, this is all there is to it. As I mentioned um, on the, with the previous slide, we have gray matter that is in the shape of a letter H or a butterfly surrounded by white matter, which is different from most parts of the brain. We recall that the cerebrum and the cerebellum, they each have a third layer which we've been, we refer to as a, a cortex layer made up of gray matter, not in the spinal cord, and neither does the brain stem. So the brain stem starts to have more of a look like the spinal cord with the inter internal gray matter surrounded by the white matter. Now we give the different regions of the gray matter and the white matter specific names, and what you're also going to see, and this is so crucial for you to understand, is that information enters the spinal cord always in one area and always leaves in another area. But before we can do that, before we can better understand why information always enters and information always leaves in a particular area, we first need to study the anatomy better. So first of all, here's that central canal in which we find cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a continuation of that fourth ventricle. If we focus on the gray matter, we divide or we refer to the different regions of the gray matter as horns. And so here we have the anterior or ventral horn. I should point more here. In some parts of the spinal cord, we may see an, a so-called lateral horn, but only in some parts. And those are the parts of the spinal cord or the regions of the spinal cord where we see um, either sympathetic or parasympathetic fibers arise. When we get to the autonomic nervous system, you will learn which specific parts of the spinal cord only provide um, uh, origins for the autonomic nervous system. So not all of the spinal cord has autonomic nervous system motor fibers arising from it. And then we have the so-called posterior or dorsal horn. So you can call these either dorsal or posterior or ventral or anterior. No biggie. Now how can you tell what is posterior, what is anterior? Um, well, the, the, the shape of the butterfly can give it away, but we'll also see something else in just a moment where we take a look at structures outside of the spinal cord to help us identify what is anterior or posterior. The spinal cord is bilaterally symmetrical, and so it has these invaginations um, right here, and we can call them the anterior and posterior median fissures. Sometimes people differentiate uh, between them calling a sulcus versus a fissure. I'm, I'm not really too picky about it. If you both call them fissures, that's fine with me. Now, the white matter is also divided up, and so we talk about columns, or sometimes we call them funiculi. So you'll see them being referred to as either the white matter portions as either columns or funiculi. And again, we have uh, the posterior or dorsal, column, lateral, and anterior. Remember, gray matter is made up of cell bodies and unmyelinated fibers, which tells you that it's in the gray matter that synapses are formed, which therefore also tells you that it's in the gray matter that integration occurs. Remember, integration always referring to the processing of information. And if we put that into uh, a more uh, concrete explanation, it's really a matter of neurotransmitters making it from one neuron to the next neuron. The, the columns, which are white matter, are going to be full of tracts, and tracts are just bundles of axons that are myelinated. 
Tracts are analogous to nerves, except that nerves are found in the peripheral nervous system only, and they are covered with uh, connective tissues. Here we don't see that, we just see naked bundles of axons that we call tracts. So like I said, information always enters the spinal cord and uh, in, in one particular area and information always leaves the spinal cord in another particular area. And it's analogous this way uh, in the brain as well, a little bit more complex. We usually just focus on the spinal cord to explain the arrangement of sensory input and motor output. So first of all, remember I said on the previous slide, you can look at structures outside of the spinal cord to better figure out what is dorsal and what is ventral. And the structure to look for is this one right here. This is a ganglion, which we will call the dorsal root ganglion. And this is a ganglion that collects the cell bodies of sensory neurons. So you see the sensory neurons illustrated on this diagram in the blue. And remember, sensory neurons always go into the central nervous system. Watch my arrows to keep track of what direction information is flowing. So from the body, sensory neurons bring in action potentials and then their axonal terminals would be arriving eventually into the gray matter where then a synapsis could occur with an interneuron. So the cell bodies of these unipolar, better called pseudo-unipolar sensory neurons, are going to be collected just outside of the central nervous system, in this case the spinal cord, and that's why we see a bit of a swelling there. Remember, a collection of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system is called a ganglion. This dorsal root ganglion, you'll often see me abbreviate it as DRG, is always located on the posterior or dorsal side of the spinal cord. So now it's going to be easier for you to understand why this is called the dorsal horn and this is the ventral horn, or this is the uh, dorsal white column or column while this would be the lateral and this is the ventral column. So that's how you can easily uh, orient yourself in and outside of the spinal cord. Now the structure that holds all the axons of the sensory neurons, we're going to give a name. It's clearly a nerve because it has lots of axons in it, but we're just going to call it the dorsal root or the dorsal root nerve. So this is called the dorsal root or the dorsal root nerve. On the other hand, Notice that information is leaving via motor neurons via the ventral root nerve. And the ventral root nerve does not have a ganglion because the cell bodies of all of the motor neurons that are leaving the central nervous system are located here in the gray matter. They're going to be primarily, for the somatic motor neurons, they're going to be in the ventral horn. While if we had a clear lateral horn, then that would be where the cell bodies of the autonomic motor neurons would be located. And this will be reiterated on a future slide, the arrangement of the cell bodies. The axonal terminals of your sensory neurons are going to be in the gray matter of the, trying to draw this here, of the um, dorsal horn. And it's possible that there is an interneuron going to be interconnecting the sensory neurons with the motor neurons or several interneurons. Um, or it is possible that there is a direct synapsis between the axonal terminals of your sensory neurons and the motor neurons. 
either with the somatic motor neurons or the autonomic motor neurons. And if that is the case, if we have a flow of information going straight into the spinal cord and then out, we're talking about a spinal reflex, which we will look at later on. All information that is entering the spinal cord will also be sent up into the brain. So there's going to be a pathway that will take the information that is arriving also into the brain via what we call ascending tracts and that's going to occur in that white matter so that we become aware of what is happening to our body or our brain receives input that tells it what to do. So again, information always enters the spinal cord via the dorsal root and information always leaves the spinal cord via the ventral root. Now notice that these two roots, which are nerves, are going to merge to form a single structure and that is the spinal nerve. So the spinal nerve is formed by the merging of the dorsal root and the ventral root. And because of, that, because of this, the spinal nerve has both sensory and motor neurons in it. And the motor neurons can be both somatic and autonomic motor neurons. Now the spinal nerve is rather short because it immediately starts to split and the two major branches we call the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus. The ventral ramus in its turn gives rise to two smaller structures and we really should be more specific about their names um, and that is they're called the white ramus communicans and the reason why I want to make this more specific is because when we get to the autonomic nervous system we're going to give them their more specific name like such while the gray ramus should really be called the gray ramus communicans as well so these are going to play an important role when we get to the autonomic nervous system and then I'll also explain to you why they're called white versus gray The previous slide should have clearly shown to you that the two roots, the dorsal and the ventral root, are going to only have one of the three functional neurons. Your dorsal roots, which do have the swelling, so right here we see the dorsal root ganglion, they are just calling it the spinal ganglion, but you can more specifically call it the dorsal root ganglion, so that root only contains sensory neurons and because of that it is an example of a sensory nerve. On the other hand the ventral root which is this one information leaves through here let me make this clear information goes up the ventral root I'm sorry the dorsal root information leaves through the uh, ventral root and so the ventral root is only going to contain motor neurons and because of that it is an example of a motor nerve. The spinal nerve on the other hand is a combination or is a merging of both um, the ventral and dorsal root meaning that we have both sensory as well as motor neurons in it and because of that we refer to it as a mixed nerve. So we have two major groups of nerves that we can classify by where they arise and that is we have our 12 pairs of cranial nerves with one nerve that we don't quite understand very well yet with plus we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves but we can also classify these nerves based on what kinds of neurons they contain, functional neurons if they mostly only contain sensory neurons, we call them sensory nerves. If they mostly only contain motor neurons, we call them motor nerves. Now, in the case of the dorsal and ventral roots of the spinal cord, uh, 
there's no such thing as mostly. We only find sensory neurons in the dorsal root and we only find motor neurons in the ventral root, as you can clearly see. So based on that, we talk about sensory nerves and motor nerves. And then we have also nerves that have both sensory as well as motor neurons in them. And then we call them mixed nerves. All 31 pairs of spinal nerves are mixed nerves. And you should understand, based on this, the, what we've just learned, that this makes total sense. Cranial nerves, on the other hand, are not all mixed. Just to give you an example, the nerve that arises from the back of your eyeballs called the optic nerves, they only carry information into the brain and therefore they're only their sensory nerves. Um, same with the nerve called the olfactory nerves that arise from your nose. And there's um, also the nerve that carries information from your ear into the spinal cord. Most other cranial nerves are either fully mixed or primarily motor nerves. We'll get to the cranial nerves later on though. Just a slide to one more time revisit definitions just to be sure that you understand all these different um, st structure names that we keep using. Remember the term nerve only applies to the peripheral nervous system. The term tract only applies to the central nervous system, even though in many ways they are referring to something very similar, and that is that both a nerve and a tract are made up of bundles of axons. Pathways are just the tracts plus the areas of synapses and cell bodies, which are often called centers. Anatomists can get a little bit relaxed about the terms tracts and pathways. Uh, we sometimes use them interchangeably. We really shouldn't. There is a difference, but just to give you uh, a little bit of a warning here. We're going to continue focusing now on the cross-section of the spinal cord and look at the arrangement of information first in the gray matter and then the white matter um, so that we can continue to better understand how information enters and leaves the spinal cord and how information travels up and down the spinal cord. You might recall when we studied the brain, we looked at the sensory homunculus and the motor homunculus, basically just reminding you of how well organized all the information that enters and leaves the brain is. We refer to that as somatotopy, meaning that um, you can literally draw, draw a map of the body onto the cerebral cortex. Well, we still have somatotopy occurring in the spinal cord, not that we can draw a, a homunculus onto the spinal cord, but still we're going to see that information um, of similar neurons is, is going to be concentrated. So first off, let's make sure that you understand the abbreviations that I'm using on this slide. So we have two types of um, sensory neurons. We have sensory neurons that we'll refer to as somatic sensory neurons. And what they do is they bring information in from parts of the body such as your skeletal muscles, your skin, your bones, your joints. Those we often refer to as structures that form part of the soma. Soma literally means body, which is a way to differentiate structures from what we refer to as the viscera. So the visceral sensory neurons carry information or carry stimuli that occur in your viscera into the central nervous system, in this case, the spinal cord. I refrain from using the term autonomic sensory um, because it is going to get too confusing when we get to the motor neurons. So with regards to the motor neurons, we have the somatic motor neurons, and remember, they only innervate skeletal muscle cells. And then we have the autonomic motor neurons, which are very often referred to as the visceral 
motor neurons. You can call them either. I will very often call them autonomic motor neurons. And these are going to be motor neurons that carry the commands in the form of action potentials to your viscera. Tell your smooth muscle to contract or not contract, um, or your heart muscle, or tell your glands to secrete or not secrete. Now, all of these different types of neurons are nicely organized inside of the gray matter of the spinal cord. So the axonal terminals of the somatic sensory neurons, meaning the neurons that bring information in from your, um, your skeletal muscles and your joints and your bones, for instance, they tend to be mostly concentrated in the um, dorsal, in the most posterior part of the, the dorsal horn. On the other hand, information coming in from the viscera, as in how much is the stomach stretching because it's filling up, how much is the bladder stretching, just to give you some information, those axonal terminals are more in this portion of our horn. And then similarly, we see that the visceral motor neurons are going to be in the lateral horn versus the somatic motor neurons in the ventral horn. Remember that, I mentioned this earlier, you don't have autonomic or visceral motor neurons arising from all parts of the spinal cord. We will specify when we get to the autonomic nervous system where exactly we do see autonomic motor neurons arising, but basically we must have a lateral horn in order for there to be room for cell bodies of the autonomic nervous system. So that lateral horn is not present throughout the nerve, the spinal cord. In other words, the whole spinal cord does not give rise to um, visceral motor neurons. It does give rise to somatic motor neurons. Somatotopy occurs in the gray matter, but definitely in the white matter. It's kind of amazing at how, how well organized all of these axons with similar functions are. And so we we have in the white matter these bundles of axons or fibers, uh, very myelinated, that can run either from the spinal cord into the brain. So the ascending tracts are going into the brain, while the descending tracts leave the brain down the spinal cord. And then the transverse tracts are going to go from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere inside of the, the spinal cord. So we're going to next begin to focus on the so-called ascending and descending tracts. And remember, they're located in the white matter, organized in columns or funiculi. There are... the, the I should say that each one of these tracts are going to typically have names that give you some idea of where their origin is. Not always, but very often. Let me show you some examples. First of all, on the, on the diagram that we're using here that we'll continue to use in the next slides, we're going to see that all of the ascending tracts, notice your arrow here, all of the ascending tracts are going to be in the blue and all of the descending tracts are going to be in the red. So all of your descending tracts in the red are identified on the left-hand side of the slide and all of the ascending tracts on the right-hand side of the slide. Now notice the names. For instance, if we look at um, the um, tracts on the right-hand side, which are your ascending tracts, very often you can tell from the name whether they're ascending or descending. Notice this says spinocerebellar. The first part of this name tells you that it's the spinal cord and then the cerebellum. This is the origin and this is the destination. The spinal cord is the origin, the cerebellum is the destination. Here we have spinothalamic, meaning starting in the spinal cord, going to the thalamus which tells you that these are ascending tracts. spino olivary. remember that there's an olive nucleus in the medulla oblongata. Um, 
all of these descending tracts, on the other hand, you'll see they all start with some kind of a word or prefix, but then they all end in spinal, every one of them. That tells you that the destination is the spinal cord. Recall that cortico, the prefix cortico, is a prefix for co cortex. Uh, more specifically, this would be the cerebral cortex. So these corticospinal tracts that you see listed here are tracts that start in the spinal cord and arrive somewhere in the cortex. And most of these belong to a group called the pyramids or the pyramidal tract. When the sensory receptors in our body, whether they're located in our muscles or in our skin, you've seen sensory receptors already in the skin, inside of our viscera, we'll learn more about sensory receptors in the PNS. But basically what the function is of those sensory receptors is to sense their environment and to convert the stimulus that they have perceived into um, action potentials that eventually make it into the brain. So central processing refers to the fact that our brain perceives these signals, meaning it processes these signals, interprets them, and then creates motor responses. You've often heard me call them commands. And we've done some of the information um, that is uh, part of, or, or some of the functions that I should say that are, that are part of perception already when we studied the brain. Um, and we'll look at reflexes when we get to the peripheral nervous system. So what we still need to do is take a closer look at the pathways and um, pathways that hold ascending tracts and pathways that hold descending tracts. There are a few generalizations that we can make when we're studying neural pathways. First of all, most of them are going to cross over. Not all of them, but most of them will decussate. And if they are considered ipsilateral, meaning that they stay on the same side of the body um, and go into the same side of the brain or leave the brain from one side of the brain and arrive in the body at that same side, most often those pathways will decussate twice to create ipsilateral pathways. Many of the pathways are going to consist of at least two neurons or three neurons in a row. And somato somatotopy is very well um, present in both the brain and the spinal cord and we're always going to see that pathways are paired and a lot of that has to do with the fact that both the brain and the spinal cord are bilaterally symmetrical. We're going to first focus on the ascending pathways which hold ascending tracts meaning information is going to come in from the body via sensory neurons and then the sensory neurons are going to synapse inside of the central nervous system with interneurons. And the interneurons are going to take the information to a particular part of the brain. We give these different neurons that are involved kind of unique names. So the very first sensory neuron, the actual sensory neuron, that starts outside of the central nervous system and that has its dendrites and axon and cell body outside of the central nervous system, better called the peripheral nervous system, is going to be the first order neuron. That's what we tend to call it. It's a sensory neuron. <clears throat> While the interneurons, depending on how many there are that are inside of the CNS with which um, your sensory neuron might be synapsing are going to be called the second interneuron. Um, that would be the one with which the sensory neuron, the first order neuron synapses. And there may be a third order neuron. Okay, The third order neuron would be the one that arises uh, from somewhere within the central nervous system 
to the destination in the central nervous system. For instance, very often we see the third order neuron um, starting in the thalamus to go to some particular functional area in the cerebral cortex. The cerebellum does not have third order neurons, by the way. So we're going to focus on some of these tracts that we find in these ascending neural pathways. The first tracts that we're going to focus on are part of a pathway with a long name. That pathway is called the, the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. Lemniscal, from what I understand, referring to a pathway that looks very ribbon-like. So there are tracts that are part of this dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway that we're going to take a look at now. These tracts arise either from your upper limbs or your lower limbs. And so depending on where they arise, we call these tracts either the fasciculus cuneatus or the fasciculus gracilis. And just to give you a little tip, what I do in my mind to remember which one arises from where is that the C becomes before the G in gracilis or the C in cuneatus comes before the G in gracilis and therefore the C or the cuneatus is the tract that arises from the upper limbs while the gracilis arises from the lower limbs. I don't know if that would help you, but that's what I do in my mind. So before we go into the details, let's just look at the diagram and recognize some structures, first of all, before um, otherwise we might get lost in this particular diagram. So we are seeing a picture here that is illustrating the cerebral cortex. And what's going to important, be important here is for us to remember that the postcentral gyrus is the area of your primary somatosensory area. That is the part of the brain where we become consciously aware of what touched our body, for instance. Um, or what kinds of, or how much stretching a muscle is undergoing, for instance. This is where we can really very carefully discriminate between um, small types of touch or pressure stimuli. Secondly, we see the thalamus right here. This is the midbrain. Remember, the midbrain is where we find the cerebral peduncles as well as the uh, superior and inferior colliculi that are part of the corpora quadrigemini. On the anterior side, that's where we would have our cerebral peduncles. On the posterior side, these bumps would be the corpora quadrigemina. This is your medulla in the brainstem. And then we finally get to the spinal cord. And notice that we're not illustrating the whole spinal cord um, to make the diagram a little bit more usable. I'm trying to emphasize that with this arrow, that information is going up, meaning from the body up the spinal cord into the brain, the cerebral cortex. Try not to forget we're looking at ascending information or ascending tracts. Okay, that said, um, two, uh, three other things to point out, and I'll use uh, some color coding. The first order neuron is illustrated in the red. The second order neuron in this diagram is illustrated in the green, and the third order neuron is illustrated in purple. So what we need to now do is trace these neurons so that we see where they originate, where they cross over. Remember, that means to decussate, where they synapse. These are all important um, aspects to know about these tracts inside of their pathways and the destination. So I already pointed out what the origins are. 
um, upper limbs and lower limbs. And this is a um, pathway that allows us to be consciously aware of what, what is happening to our body. And we can really very carefully specify where the stimulus is coming from in the particular parts of the upper and lower limbs. So here we have our sensory neurons coming into the spinal cord, um, leaving their cell bodies behind in the dorsal root ganglion right here. And then these sensory neurons are going to travel up into the white matter of our spinal cord all the way up to the medulla. And in the medulla, we see that decussation occurs inside of the medulla. So now we're switching over to our second order neuron. So in the red was our first order neuron. Now we're going to switch to the green color. So synapses occurs in the medulla as well as crossing over. So here is the cell body of that second order neuron. It crosses over to the other side and now moves via the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain towards the thalamus. So this is our second order neuron. So there we see a second synapsis in the thalamus. And from there, our third order neuron starts with its cell body in the gray matter of the spine the thalamus and then sends its axon to that primary somatosensory area inside of the postcentral gyrus of the cerebral cortex. So we have three consecutive neurons carrying the action potentials from the body into a very specific area of the cerebral cortex. The fact that the stimuli go up these particular axons of this tract and the fact that they arrive in a particular area of the brain, that is what allows us not only to become consciously aware of these stimuli, but also where exactly they are coming from. And this is why we refer to these tracts as specific ascending tracts. By the way, to come back for a moment to the principle of somatotopy, your fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis tracts that arise from the limbs, they are going to be sitting very parallel to one another in the spinal cord. And once we get to the, um, to the brain, we refer to these tracts instead as the medial lemniscus tracts. So all of these together form the pathway we call the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. A pathway that allows us to detect fine touch, allows us to, um, un to sense proprioception, which refers to the stretching of muscles and the movement of joints, uh, things like that. The second type of ascending tracts that you are accountable for, we refer to as non-specific ascending tracts. And they're going to convey information about pain stimuli and temperature sensations. If you think about this, these, these are the kinds of stimuli that we typically have a very hard time um, um, locating very specifically. At times we might be able to say, this is exactly where I hurt. But that is very often because you can see where you were hurt. Um, if you could not really see it, it might be much more difficult. So these nonspecific ascending tracts um, are actually types of so-called spinothalamic tracts. And there's, um, there's a couple of those. Lateral, the lateral spinal thalamic tracts are the ones we are focusing on. So let's do what we did with um, the previous picture and first point out all the major anatomical structures. Once again, we have showing here the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, 
the midbrain, the medulla, and then the spinal cord. Um, we're going to have our three orders of neurons. We have our first order neuron bringing information in via the uh, dorsal horn into the spinal cord. And notice I kind of hit this with my arrow there, but right here we see not only a synapsis occurring inside of the spinal cord, so we're synapsing much more inferiorly this time, plus we're already crossing over. So the crossing over and synapsis is occurring at the level of the spinal cord. So here we have the cell body of our second order neuron. It's crossing over. We're going up into the brainstem. Here's your medulla. Here's your midbrain. And now we're once again synapsing in the thalamus. Remember that almost all information except for olfaction that is entering into the brain will synapse in the thalamus. And at the level of the thalamus, we're going to see the start of our third order neuron to go to um, the um, cerebral cortex. As I said, this is the pathway or these tracts, the spinal thalamic tracts are parts of pathways that um, do not allow us to discriminate between the stimuli extremely well. So we talk about poor localization and the, the, the examples of stimuli would be pain, temperature and crude touch. We see that the decussation is in the spinal cord, the synapses, the first synapses is this time in the spinal cord as well with the second one again in the thalamus. Clearly a, another example of a contralateral series of tracts. Um, and the destination is again going to be in the post-central gyrus of the cerebral cortex. There are also spinocerebellar cere tracts um, that are ascending tracts, you can tell from their name, and they only involve two neurons, first order and second order, because the thalamus is not involved. We find that these are tracts that your um, muscle spindles, which are sensory receptors in the muscles and sensory receptors in the joints called Golgi tendon organs, depend on to inform the cerebellum of how much the muscles are being stretched or not stretched and the joints being moved or not moved so that your cerebellum can inform the cerebral cortex of the adjustments that should be made in the tension in the muscles. This is all occurring at an unconscious level. Um, you're going to see that these tracts sit really, really lateral in the spinal cord in the next picture. And once again, thalamus is not involved and these are ipsilateral tracts. So tracts that are part of the cerebellum are going to be ipsilateral and this means that they either do not cross over at all, so no decussation or there is a double, double crossing over. Uh, there are a few who are contralateral but really the majority of them are ipsilateral. So notice here in this diagram to continue for just a second longer with the ascending pathways that the spinocerebellar tracts sit very laterally in the gray in the white matter I'm sorry of the spinal cord so on either side everything is bilaterally symmetrical remember that now we're going to focus on some descending pathways and remember this diagram uh, colors the descending pathways in the red. So we're now uh, looking at the names of these tracts. Everything is bilaterally symmetrical. So we have everything on both sides, both ascending and descending pathways. But just to, to simplify labeling structures, we've this diagram focuses on labeling ascending pathways on the right hand side in the blue and descending pathways with their tracts on the left hand side in the red. Okay, so when it comes to descending pathways, we're dealing with just two neurons. 
Now their names can get very confusing, so be sure to pay good attention here so that you don't get all um, frustrated in the next few slides trying to figure out what I'm trying to explain to you. Two neurons. Remember, these are descending pathways or the tracts of descending pathways. So we're going to now start in the brain. So the very first neuron we call the upper motor neuron. We're inside of the brain. We haven't left the brain or the spinal cord. It's going to start in the brain, go down the spinal cord. Yet we call it an upper motor neuron. This term motor neuron should be in parentheses because if we're staying inside of the CNS, it's truly an interneuron, isn't it? So be careful, an upper motor neuron is really an interneuron. The lower motor neuron, on the other hand, will synapse with the upper motor neuron, but will then leave the CNS. And so by that definition, it is a true motor neuron. Now, the descending pathways consist of two major groups. We have the descending pathways that contain the pyramidal tracts. And you've heard me talk about the pyramids. And there's different pyramidal tracts, uh, but they're all a type of corticospinal tract. Remember to translate this, cortico referring to cortex, spinal referring to the spinal cord. So this tells you this is a descending tract. These are the best understood, and we're going to study those, therefore, a little bit more than the indirect path pathways, which are very often referred to as the extrapyramidal tracts, meaning they are pyramidal, they're not part of the pyramidal tracts, they're extrapyramidal tracts. They're rather complex, and we're just going to say a few words about them. So let's take a look at these pyramids also called the corticospinal tracts. There are two kinds. We have the ones that are called the lateral corticospinal tracts. We're going to focus on those in this picture, uh, but there are also the anterior ones and they go to slightly different destinations and are going to cross over in different areas. So let's focus on those lateral corticospinal tracts, which are the best understood and they are the bigger ones, the easier ones to see. Like we did with the previous image, I want to point out the major anatomical structures and then we will follow the upper motor neurons and the um, lower motor neurons. Once again, we're dealing with descending tracts, so we're going to start in the brain, down the brain stem, and then down the spinal cord and then out of the body, towards the body, I should say. So <clears throat> this time, we're not looking at the post-central gyrus, but the pre-central gyrus. Remember, that is where our primary motor cortex is located. Here we see the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain, and here we get to the medulla. Notice that we see that decussation is occurring of the um, pyramids, the, the, the lateral corticospinal tracts in particular which is the most superior portion uh, for decussation of descending tracts, by the way. They then continue to descend down the spinal cord until they finally synapse in the spinal cord to create your lower motor neuron, which is your true motor neuron, to go to the skeletal muscles. So if we now illustrate the uh, different... Um, neurons, I guess I'll use the yellow for the upper motor neurons. So all of these are upper motor neurons here and they are going to continue going down. This is all one neuron all the way down to the spinal cord to synapse finally. I'm sorry, yellow is maybe not the best color, but this is your upper motor neuron. And remember that is really a Internew an interneuron because we're staying inside of the central nervous system, whether it's the brain or the spinal cord. And then we're seeing that um, in the spinal cord, a synapsis will occur between one of those upper motor neurons and uh, a lower motor neuron. And here is the synapsis. The cell body of this lower motor neuron will be in the ventral horn, 
just as a quick refresher of the spinal cord and send its axon out through the ventral um, roots into the spinal nerve and eventually the action potentials will go to skeletal muscles. Now for your lateral corticospinal tracts, these will be the skeletal muscles um, of your appendicular part of the body, meaning those skeletal muscles that move your limbs. Like I said, we also have um, an anterior corticospinal tract series that are still part of the pyramids. They control your trunk muscles and you can see them uh, labeled here. The other major part of the descending pathways we refer to as the extrapyramidal pathways or the indirect pathways. Um, they're rather complex and a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Uh, they involve several neurons typically and they're going to control our balance and posture to some extent, some of our head, neck and eye movements and coarse movements of the, the, the limbs. And that's pretty much all we're going to say about them except for the fact that they are not part of your pyramid. So they're uh, other tracts aside from the pyramids. So with the help of the information you've just learned about the spinal cord, you've learned about its longitudinal section, you've learned about its cross section, you should by now be pretty familiar with how information always enters and always leaves the spinal cord. You should have an understanding of the ascending and descending tracts. Um, and because of that information, it will make much more sense why certain types of damage to the spinal cord and its surroundings will impact a patient in a particular way. If the spinal cord is cut or damaged at a particular level, that patient will lose function of everything below that level. Therefore, if a patient experiences damage to the cervical region of the spinal cord, that patient is going to lose function of pretty much everything below that part of the body. In other words, that person is going to not be able to use his or her limbs, doesn't feel from the upper limbs or the lower limbs, so a quadriplegic. On the other hand, if the damage occurs primarily in the thoracic spinal cord, we see the patient will lose function of the lower limbs and can't feel from the lower limbs, but um, will still be able to use the upper limbs. There are two forms of paralysis, and most of us, when we think of paralysis, we think of a condition where a patient cannot move skeletal muscles anymore. That is actually called flaccid paralysis. And that is going to be due to damage to the ventral or anterior root of the spinal cord or the um, anterior or ventral horn of the spinal cord. Remember, it is the ventral horn that holds the cell bodies of the somatic motor neurons. Somatic motor neurons are leaving the spinal cord, going directly to the skeletal muscles to release acetylcholine and make them move. So if these anterior horn cells are damaged, action potentials will not get sent to those skeletal muscles. If there's damage in the ventral root, that is the root nerve through which the somatic motor neurons must travel. Again, interruption of the action potentials. So to say this in different words, the lower motor neurons are damaged due to the ventral root or anterior horn uh, damage and the impulses cannot reach your skeletal muscles. So there's neither voluntary or involuntary control of the muscles. So there is also something called spastic paralysis, and this is where the upper motor neurons are damaged. Remember, those are the interneurons that start in the brain, travel through the brain stem down the spinal cord, and eventually in the spinal cord are going to, to synapse with the somatic motor neurons, better called the lower motor neurons. So when they are damaged, basically we have damaged 
uh, definitely inside of the central nervous system, could be in the brain, it could be in the spinal cord. Um, we find that our, the muscles of the patient will still contract at times because they're still um, being, I shouldn't use the term innervated, but they still have uh, some interaction, believe it or not, with those lower motor neurons, those somatic motor neurons. But those somatic motor neurons are not controlled anymore by the upper motor neurons. The upper motor neurons, remember, synapse with the lower motor neurons. And so these lower motor neurons, the somatic motor neurons, tend to stimulate the skeletal muscles at, at irregular um, and in, um, in, in, in an involuntary way. And so we see these spastic movements of the skeletal muscles because we don't have the uh, regulation of the lower motor mo neurons by the upper motor neurons anymore. There are also a, a couple of conditions I know all of you have heard of, and both of them revolve around damage to the anterior or ventral horn motor neurons uh, of the spinal cord. In other words, your somatic motor neuron cell bodies. In the case of polio, better called poliomyelitis, the um, the pathogen literally destroys that part of the spinal cord. Um, Lou Gehrig's disease is a condition that um, people develop later on in life, better referred to as ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, there, what we see happening is... Um, not just destruction of the anterior horn motor neurons, but also the axons of the pyramids. So also damage to the upper motor neurons. And unfortunately, a person who's diagnosed with ALS goes downhill very fast and does not have much more uh, to live. And so this wraps up our discussion of the spinal cord. We're going to next take a closer look at the rest of the peripheral nervous system.